today we're going to talk about between me and uh, Julia, and I guess somewhat Eileen. Yeah, she did her part, sort Unfortunately, of. Unfortunately, she did do a video in the call, but the link previously worked, and then the box deleted the link, and she so had to slap it over the weekend. So, um, it's totally she fine. She consented that when she responded. <laughs> so she the, did do it. The BCSC definition of what functional vision loss is, it's non-organic or non-physiologic vision loss, complaints of visual symptoms that have no physiologic or organic basis. There are four major categories. They include an afferent visual pathway, where the visual acuity or the visual field is affected, the ocular motility and alignment, pupils and accommodation, or the eyelid position and function as well. Some of the associated sight disorders that the BCSC wants you to know about include malingering, which is the willful feigning or exaggeration of symptoms for secondary gain, it's often monetary. Uh, Munchausen syndrome, where it's a feigned or induced physical damage for secondary psychological gain, such as getting attention from a physician. Um, and hysteria, where you just have this subconscious expression of non-organic signs and symptoms. And often these patients um, exhibit uh, behaviors where they're unconcerned about their symptoms. So. Uh, that's usually like the uh, distinguishing fe feature for hysteria. So what's the significance of functional vision loss? Well, you have, to, you have to watch out when you suspect functional vision loss because you don't want to become the, you know, the person who's working against the physician. You really want to try to help them out and try to figure out why they're acting this way or why they're having these symptoms. So it's important for the physician not to work against the patient but actually try to work with the patient. And don't stop at the diagnosis, you know, treat it as if it's a real diagnosis and that they need treat the proper treatment as well. So the diagnostic approach, so establish good rapport with the patient from the start of the exam. Don't start with, wait, are you really sure that you can see, you know, out of both eyes, just be, be, you know, be normal. Um, perform H&P assuming that the patient does not have functional vision loss, you know. Treat it as if it's something real and take a full H&P, you know, treat it seriously. Um, and then pay attention to whether the history does not make sense with the level of vision loss. That's when you should start suspecting whether or not functional vision loss is actually real. Um, and uh, during the history also, you also want to see, you want to you keep a close ear to um, whether or not there's potential secondary gains. So if the patient starts focusing on <coughs> impending litigation and or disability determination rather than on the diagnosis and the treatment, right, that's a little suspect. And you should always um, try to implement the everything counts principle, where each piece of information from the moment that they make the appointment all the way to the end of the appointment, right, is really important, okay? Um, it helps to direct, like, what you exactly want to do during the examination. And in the tertiary neuro-ophthalmology neuro uh, uh, office setting, it says in the BCSC that patients who wore sunglasses we're more likely to have non-organic vision loss, but I don't think that's entirely true because I know that CAT says that, you know, there are many patients with real organic disease or photophobic that wear sunglasses to the, uh, to the appointment. There was a study out of Atlanta by the other very large neuro group that if you wore sunglasses when you came into the clinic, there was a likelihood of you having non-organic vision loss is higher than if you had patients who did not sunglasses on. FL41s are obviously very different from the dark sunglasses, but you have to kind of, <coughs> with the, the dry eye symptoms that we have in Utah, you have to be aware of the fact that sunglasses is not always a sign of not remaining vision. Thank you, Dr. <coughs> So some of the general behavior and ocular capabilities, um, so things that you want to pay attention to, can the patient ambulate into the room, <coughs> into the chair? If they say that they can't see at all, you know, out of either eye, but they're, they're able to do that, you know, that's a visual task. Um, can they find and shake the physician's silently outstretched hand on arrival? So you don't say anything, but you just reach your hand out. If they reach out their hand as well, you know they can see at least that. And then is there a problem with the non-visual tasks, such as signing it at the front desk? Uh, focus on whether the exam does not make sense with the level of vision loss, and you always want to use misdirection, and we'll go over some of these techniques. Um, so you're pretending like you're testing vision in one eye, but you're actually testing the vision in the bad eye, you know. Um, and then diagnostic confirmation usually is achieved when the patient does something that should not be possible based on the stated symptoms. So for the next part of my talk, I'm going to go over some of the tests that you should implement 
when somebody complains about monocular vision loss, right? Um, and then Julie, I think, is going to cover the binocular vision loss test. So first thing you should check for, obviously, you know, do a full exam, but the most important uh, parts of the exam include check for the normal pupillary responses. You know, an APD should be present if there's it's fully organic in the, uh, in the right eye, um, unless it's post-chiasmal. Um, I mean, not post-chiasmal, post, uh, uh, past the uh, lateral geniculate nucleus, then you can get um, uh, vision loss uh, without an APD. But then you also have a monocular prism test with a four base out prism test. So what you do is, if somebody's complaining about you know, poor vision in, one, in the right eye, say they can't see in the, out of the right eye, you take a four base out prism, put it over that right eye. Both eyes should shift towards the apex of the prism, right? And then the, the bad eye will stay fixed you know, in that direction, and then the, the good eye should refixate or converge, okay? Um, if they do do that, you know that they, they at least have some vision out of that the eye that you put the prism over. Okay, so that's, that's one way of testing that. You also have the vertical prism dissociation test. You put a four base, prism, uh, four base down prism uh, over the good eye. Patient with symmetric vision should be able to see the two objects kind of superimposed on each other. You know, they'll see two objects basically inducing diplopia. Um, however, if there's true vision loss in the bad eye, then they should only be able to see one image. Okay. Does that make sense to everybody? And then there's also the fogging test. It's one of the confusion tests. Basically, you're, this is uh, the concept of misdirection. You make the patient, put, with the phoropter, you put plus 10 diopters in the good eye, and then Plano or their current prescription in their bad eye. Then you tell the patient that you're making sure their good eye is still okay. Then you ask, is one or two better, as you change the good eye from plus 10 to plus, you know, uh, 9.75, then you go back to plus 10 while you're leaving the bad eye at the current <coughs> prescription. You just keep doing that saying like, oh yeah, you know, is your vision getting better? And if their vision does get better and they start reading the 2040 line, then you know that they're reading out of that, the bad eye. This sure. doesn't work on people that are plus 10 now. <laughs> <laughs> Very true, that's right. All right, and then stereo vision testing. Be careful that some patients uh, just pick up on monocular cues, but the concept behind here is that Binocular vision is really is necessary in order to induce some sort of uh, stereo vision, so you know at least that they're able to see out of the other eye. And then there's the Pulfrich phenomenon. Um, can one of the PGY choose tell me what the Pulfrich phenomenon is? Go ahead, Lee. So <clears throat> this is where because of degeneration to say the nerve uh, transmission, you can have a slowing effect, kind of a it's almost like if you use a pendulum, you'll see like an elliptical type of effect to the vision as a result of poor um, nerve transmission from the retina to the... That's right. It's due to poor conduction. It's like um, in the rate of conduction between the two optic nerves. That's why you'll see that the, the, the image actually, something that's swinging back and forth perpendicular to the visual action, axis will actually look like it's coming back and forth, right? So with the Pulfrich phenomenon, you can use this. You place a 0.9 log unit filter over the good eye, tell the patient you're testing the good eye, and then swing the pendulum back and forth perpendicular to the visual axis. And if the patient sees it moving in a circle, then they likely have binocular vision in this setting. And then lastly, all the tests that um, Julia is going to go over for binocular vision testing, you can also use those for monocular vision testing as well. In terms of management, uh, what do you do once the diagnosis is made? So you, encouragement and understanding are key, you know, being empathetic, because a lot of times this is very real to the patient, so don't just be dismissive. Confrontation should be avoided, obviously. Reassure the problem that the problem is real and it will resolve over time. Stress, stress that the patient has a good prognosis. And if the complaint is in mono, has, is monocular vision, consider patching the good eye for limited periods of time each day to train the bad eye to see again. Uh, if the patient's a child, involve the parents in the discussion, obviously. And then consider how to address underlying, the underlying issue. Like, for instance, this site really needs to be evaluated. You know, need to evaluate this patient. Um, there's our new little guy, Ezra. For those of you who never saw this. All right. Three questions. Name two prism tests you can use to confirm functional monocular vision loss. <coughs>
ready for the next one? Tell me first one. So you do four base down over the bat eye, mm -hmm. and there's four base down over the guy. All right, good man. And then Ashley, what'd you get for this one? Basically what happens if you put the prism over the bad eye, they should both shift and then the one that the prism's not over should reconverge. Yeah, so that's oh, what it's big. And then uh, Chris, what's this one? Conradi? No. Um, you might have actually come in late, so I don't think you cover this one, but Rick's. Green? Yeah, that's it. Yep. 